this is Marvin Glotfelty with another NGWA Industry Connected video for you today. Um, today we want to talk about water quality and how it can be positively impacted with well design. And when we look at water quality, you know, we all want we all want and need to have water meet the intended uh, uh, purpose of the well. So if it's a let's say for a power plant. Now we have to worry about elevated silica concentrations, but we may not worry about something else like um, arsenic or fluoride, you know, maybe metals that would exceed drinking water standards, but not be problematic, problematic in the industrial process. If it's for stock watering, we have standards, but they're different. If it's for agriculture, we just want to be sure that elevated concentrations of things like boron or total dissolved solids aren't too high so that the plants can grow efficiently and readily. But for drinking water, that's a lot of the wells, whether it's for a household or for a community, we want to, we must meet the uh, EPA drinking water standards. So um, looking at those, of course, a lot of the information I have is from large public supply wells. So that would not be a household well, it would be a large city of whatever well or whatever water company well. So um, I have some comparisons there. And um, this really strikes back to the approach I took when I gave my McElhaney lecture back in 19 or back in 2012. It seems like the 1900s, but it's 2012. So at that time, I did life cycle economic analysis and what I compared were different metals that you can make screen out of. We looked at stainless steel, high strength low alloy and low carbon steel and compared out through a 75 year life cycle of a well. You know, what would it cost? Of course, the stainless steel is most expensive at the start, but there was millions of dollars saved at the end of 75 years. So. It depends on the purpose. If there's the long view from that well owner and they want it for the long run, then they can know that they would have their money back over and over and over again. This is all also true for water quality. So how do we address water quality when we design a well? Well, we do our best based on the regional data and we write up the technical specifications, but we must collect site specific information. In other words, depth specific water samples. So we isolate intervals up and down the borehole and we have stratified water quality. Different water quality comes in at different depths. And so we can know that for sure at our location. And at each of those locations, we can also know the proportional gallons per minute that comes in. It's not equal for every depth. And so there's ways to measure that with a falling head test while we have these intervals isolated. So I looked at all those costs. OK, that that's my additional cost. Is that worth it or not? That really is the question. We can design a well to make water, but to design a well to make good water quality to the levels that we want, that's this additional effort and this additional cost, both on the part of the hydrogeologist that's looking at it and collecting it and on the part of the driller that's doing the setup to allow us to collect these samples. So. I thought, well, let's compare that with the treatment cost that we might otherwise incur if we have wellhead treatment. So I got some numbers for this, but they were 10. They're now 10 years old. So uh, these are from 2011 and these are numbers for about four different types of treatment that I got from a design engineer. So these were from actual costs they provided to their clients back in 2011. I called just this morning another water treatment engineer and said, oh, I have these numbers for and they're just operations and maintenance. They're not to build a treatment plant. They're just to operate it month after month. Well, would they still be applicable? And he said, no, uh, they things went down in price from uh, 2011 down to about 2015, but then they went up. So he said today you would add about 15 percent to them. Fair enough. Let's consider that. But let's also use these numbers from 2011 be a little bit conservative. Now, keep in mind, all of these numbers are for treating a thousand gallons per minute, a typical large well. So you have to scale that down. Um, then the answer may be different if it's a under the sink household treatment compared to a municipal scale 
uh, wellhead treatment. But here's the numbers. And this is, again, operation and maintenance. It's not how much it costs to build this facility, it's how much it is to just operate it month after month. So one type of treatment is coagulation filtration. For that, it costs, depending on whether we need to do pH adjustment or whether we can put the, the, the wastewater into a sewer or if we have to dispose of it otherwise, things like that. It could be between $2,200 per month up to $8,000 per month. That's the O&M cost. What if we have something like arsenic that we're going to treat and we have absorptive media, a resin of sorts, that has to be traded out periodically. If we're going to treat 1,000 gallons per minute of arsenic, I arsenic, and of course the concentrations would, would matter too, but uh, these are generalized numbers. The cost per month for O&M, based on the engineer's report to me, 20000 to 22000 So that's how much it costs every single month if you're going to treat that water. What about granulated activated carbon, DAC, those big uh, vessels through which we run water, takes everything out. We just have to replace the activated carbon from time to time. That can be $100,000 per month for 1,000 gallons per minute. And then there's membrane treatment is the last one. And there's two types that are similar in cost. One is electrodialysis reversal, known as EDR. And the other one is reverse osmosis RO. Well, my simple geologist brain thinks of this as a super duper coffee pot. It just runs this water through a super duper filter and gets everything out of it at the molecular level. But it's high pressure, it's high energy, and what comes out is completely potable water, but the other wastewater is a brine that has to be disposed of and managed. So we have a range. If we can discharge our brine to the sewer, sometimes you can, I suppose, $26,000 per month is what it costs for this approach. If we can't and we have to do brine management of some other type, the estimate I was given was $105,000 per month. So these are pretty big numbers, but remember we're talking about a thousand gallons per minute and in reality if we had to treat just a thousand gallons per minute we would probably side stream half of that or less, treat it, bring it back and re-blend it with the raw water to where it would be less. So if we're, <clears throat> if we're treating a thousand gallons per minute we would uh, potentially be producing way more than that, maybe two thousand gallons per minute or more. So but these are big numbers um, and they're monthly. Well, what about the cost of doing this depth specific sampling in a new well? How can we avoid this? What's the, uh, what's the comparison cost? Well, if we drill a borehole, <clears throat> we typically will collect between five and 10 samples, depth specific samples. So more common is five, less common when we're more extens extensive with our research is 10. So I used five as a number here. We could double them um, for the driller cost. And I got, I happen to have a well that's going to start literally next week. I got the bids in within the last month and the uh, range from high to low bids or per sample, including those standby time while we do falling head tests and the collecting of the water and all that from the driller was between $9,800 per sample to $12,450 per sample. Okay, so that's the range per sample. Five, so we'll say five samples. The uh, consultant costs. The costs for uh, my firm, for the analytical laboratory and all that is $2,842 per sample. So around that, say $3,000 per sample. Okay, so that means the total cost per sample is about a little over $15,000. And so we could say that for five samples, we're going to pay $76,500 for this well. That's the additional cost on top of all the other construction costs, materials, everything that we're going to do to install a municipal well. So that $75,000 compared to those other monthly samples, that means that our payback, and we're comparing the design effort to the wellhead treatment effort, our payback is between one month and 35 months. That's three years. So we'll have a payback of this effort in three years and then be money ahead for the entire life of the well. And we might even be 
money ahead after one month. So it's kind of uh, easy to know that if we can design the well to avoid the water quality problem, it is always better to do that. When do we not do that? There are times it's when the water is not stratified. If we have, let's say, total dissolved solids is elevated or arsenic is elevated or fluoride, some one of these natural contaminants, and it's top to bottom, we can't change the well design and get the good water compared to the bad water. So that means we must either blend or do wellhead treatment. But if we can take this other route and design the well to optimize the water quality, it is always going to be financially better to do that. And this economic look is a good way to present it from groundwater professionals to clients because everybody's thinking about money. Huh? And it's not very few, even a even an industrial facility that's going to have a 20 year life wants to think about that 20 years or a 10 year life. You know, um, they they everybody wants to to think about it to the end of their period, to the to the time that they retire. You know, and so that is that is a good way for us to look at it. And so we uh, we should as we go forward. So with that, I, I as I've, I've done so many times in the past, I advocate good well design through site-specific consideration, and that's going to allow us to optimize our water quality for whatever purpose it's being used. Thank you very much, and I'll talk to you next time.